I want to welcome everybody here. Thank you for taking the time to sit through the class, for showing the interest in the class. Um, for those of you who do not know, my name is Jim Bollinger. I have a channel, Do Right Fabrication. I have a shop at the house at home on my farm. I'm a full-time firefighter paramedic for the City of Orlando Fire Department. My shop at home, I do a little bit of machining, a little bit of welding, actually a lot of welding. I teach for Lincoln. I started doing that many, many years ago. Uh, this is the class I teach a couple times a year. Uh, we usually will teach about 1,500 students the same class. Any alloy that can be welded can be welded in the TIG process. So that means we can do aluminum, we can do steel, we can do stainless steel, copper, nickel, bronze, pastelloy, uh, titanium, I mean, we, I, we can go on and on. What's that? Chromoly. If this is all of the metals that we want to weld, that are weldable alloys, you look at this stack of books right here, okay? This is all of them. All of them are welded in DC electrode negative, but two. This gentleman got it right here, aluminum and magnesium. There's two. We're going to put them in this pile. So all of them are in this pile, DC electrode negative, except two. They're ugly brothers to each other, magnesium and aluminum. With this caveat being told you about magnesium, it can be welded safely, but does anybody know what happens to magnesium when you get it really hot? <laughs> As a fireman, let me tell you, you can't put it out with water. If you've ever seen a Volkswagen bug, somebody try to squirt water in the back of one of those things where in that fire, it explodes. The reason being, magnesium burns so hot, it separates the hydrogen and oxygen, burns the hydrogen, combines and makes water again. And it goes kapow. Let's talk about aluminum for a minute. Mechanically, how do we, how do we clean it? Stainless steel wire brush is correct. There's other ways. Chemical, we can use chemicals, we can use acetone. Can we grind it? I got one yes and one no, they're both correct. Depends on what you're grinding it with. If we were to use an aluminum oxide grinding wheel like a flap disc, we'd use to sharpen lawnmower blades or grind our stick welds off, that's exactly the wrong thing to do. So is a piece of sandpaper. The reason is this is a soft alloy. When we, when we use that stuff, it embeds the abrasive in here. When we weld that, it becomes part of our weld puddle. When it becomes part of our weld putty, that's where it's called a discontinuity, and that's where a crack starts to form in our weld. There are wheels that are made specifically for grinding aluminum, and when it sheds, it does not re-impregnate. And that's the, about the most scientific answer I can give you on that, okay? So, stainless steel wire brush. Why a stainless steel wire brush? This gentleman's on it. A steel wire brush, all nice and clean and pretty and new. If you're to look at it under a microscope, it's already started to rust. You take it to this aluminum and you start, go to clean it, those particles of iron oxide come off and they get impregnated the same as the grit in the grinding wheel did. Same thing happens. You get a discontinuity in your weld. However, if you use a stainless steel wire brush, you take a Sharpie pen or a permanent marker and you write aluminum only on it. Don't use it to clean spark plugs of your grill, okay? because the same thing happens over again. It's only for aluminum. There's chemicals. One is known under the name, uh, trade name All Clean. It's uh, phosphoric acid. You can dip the part in it. Um, Non-chlorinated brake cleaner. Notice I said non-chlorinated. If you get chlorinated brake cleaner and you burn it, do you know what you get? Phosgene. Does anybody know what phosgene gas essentially is? Yep. Mustard gas. Ask the guys during World War I how that worked out for them. So, you can use a non-chlorinated brake cleaner or you can just go buy some acetone. Acetone is highly volatile. That means it does what? Evaporates. Evaporates quickly. But if, it, if it's volatile, it also burns. It's a VOC, volatile organic compound. So we don't want to leave it on our welding table after we've cleaned it before we weld. Because that rag just became a wick. There's a lot of aluminums especially, and some uh, cast irons, they, they just don't weld. Does anybody ever wonder why they rivet the skins of airplanes on? What they put into that alloy to get the ductility, the, the corrosion resistance, the extreme amount of strength for being very thin, makes it a not weldable alloy. So they have to rivet them on. There are about 7,000 aluminum alloys. When welding aluminum, the filler metal has to pair to the base metal. The way you quickly rectify that problem Google aluminum alloy chart. Most likely the number one is gonna be Alcoa. Look at what you're welding. I'm welding 5052 aluminum. Right there it'll say 4043 is your number one filler, 5356 is your number two filler. Don't let that scare you. 4043 is the most common, 5356 is right there behind it. 
but if you're using some weird alloy, sometimes 4043 won't work, especially if you're trying to make a part and anodize it. Anodizing won't stick to 4043. You have to use 5356. The reason is they put a lot of silica in 4043. It helps with the wetting and washing in to get the puddle to lay down real nice, but the anodizing won't stick to the silica. I have a buddy who did uh, built a T-top for his boat, put a beautiful set of rocket launchers on the back. If you don't know what rocket launchers are, that's what they put the deep sea rods in to hold them up on the T-top. I mean, it was a beautiful job sending off to have it all anodized. He welded it with 4043 and he's really upset when he came back and none of the welds anodized. He had every, every weld didn't anodize. If you don't know what the alloy is, call the manufacturer if it's important. If you're welding a landing gear on an airplane, don't put a TIG torch to it until you know by the manufacturer what the alloy is. If you're welding your garbage can toter to take garbage cans to the street, most common filler is 4043 or 5356. 4043 is what I keep the most of in my shop. But that aluminum alloy chart, it's free on Google. There's like a bazillion hits for it. It'll tell you, if you know your base alloy, what to use for your number one filler or your number two filler. Yes. So that has to do, his, his question was, when I go to weld apart, I have a hard time getting a bead in aluminum to start. The reason it does that is because of the high thermal conductivity of the aluminum. Think about our amplifiers. How many people in high school had a big old stereo and had all those aluminum fins on the back? That thermal conductivity of the aluminum was used to get the heat off the power transistors so we didn't roach the power transistors in them. That high thermal conductivity, when you hit the aluminum, it's ripping the heat away from you. So when you say come in hard and fast, you can do that, but realize that you're heat shocking and you're causing a great differential of heat. A lot of times it's better to come in easy and just be patient, let the heat build in the part, and then get the heat to get the puddle started. You've heard of preheating, possibly heard of preheating parts before. That's where a lot of it comes from, like cylinder heads, big things. They'll preheat them in an oven and bring them out so they're already at a couple hundred degrees. This is the filler metal we're talking about. I've talked about this in a couple of my videos. They come this length, okay? When you're starting off practicing TIG welding, number one thing I recommend is take a pair of wire cutters and cut this in half. Because when you're trying to learn to feed this into your TIG weld, and this thing is out here doing like that, it's like gonna be like a, a two-year-old with a magic marker, okay? <laughs> cut it in half, it doesn't move as far. Now you do waste a little bit more, I get it. But that's part of learning. All of these um, alloys, with the exception of the stainless, are coined. It's coined with the alloy number in it. The stainless alloys, they don't coin because stainless is really hard. It's a much harder metal. When you see the alloy numbers, they, they mean something specific. And aluminum, it's specific to that. 4043 has a certain amount of silica, a certain amount of aluminum, a certain amount of copper. In steel wire, it has an, uh, an ER number. Let me just tell you real quick what it stands for. ER70S and X is a variable. ER is electrode, R is rod. Why is it an electrode? Does anybody know why TIG welding wire is an electrode? It's really not complicated. <laughs> but you don't know this unless you know it. Because it's MIG wire. It's MIG wire that they cut in links. So if you run out of TIG filler and you're doing a project, go over to your MIG machine to pull some and just straighten it out, it comes off the same line in the plant. Okay, they just straighten it and coin it. Does anybody know what the 70 stands for? Or what it indicates? PSI of the weld, I didn't hear what you said, but I... It's the PSI. So when done correctly, an ER70 wire will give you a 70,000 PSI weld. So if it was an ER80, it would give you 80,000. What about an ER110? 110,000 PSI weld. The filler metal becomes more expensive. That's why you don't see it. But in spec welds, it's called for. The S is, um, stands that it's a solid wire. Well, why would wire be solid? If you're a MIG welder and you've ever welded with flux wire, it's not a solid wire. It has flux in the middle of the wire. And the way they do that is actually patented. Lincoln, they, they invented it. But that little O23 wire has flux down the center of it. At the end, the X is replaced by the chemistry, and that will change from metal filler to metal to filler metal. Yes, sir. His question is, how do you know the filler metal size do you match it to the tungsten? No, you don't match it to the tungsten, but you match it to what you're welding. If you're welding a little tiny part, you don't want to use a big fat filler rod like that. And here's why. You may only be welding like 12 amps. 12 amps won't melt that. It might melt with that material that's so thin, but I can't melt my filler metal. You need to size it and go to like a, like a, a 023 MIG wire. I use 023 MIG wire a lot. 
it takes a lot less heat to melt this being smaller. So to answer your question, it's gonna be current and, and what you're welding. The current has to match what you're welding. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed what you saw here today. Be sure to subscribe to my channel and like us on Facebook, please. Somewhere down below here is a link. We've got a lot more really cool stuff coming. Is that right, camera guy? Is there a link down there? Send me a comment. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Click whatever link. Click something. See you soon.